Welcome everyone to our episode 74 of our season 4 in Cultivating a New Generation podcast. In today's episode, we are going to discuss a topic about exercise. Exercise your path to heal and rejuvenate. We are going to dive into a lot of science of how new molecules have been discovered in the realm of the exercise science and how simply by walking, by running, by swimming, by doing some physical activity, we can improve the way our metabolic health is being um, constructed. We can clean epigenetic marks. We can also improve our cognitive function and we can rewire literally our brains. So without further ado, let's go to the topic and to talk about this um, amazing experience of exercise, I used the article of um, M.A., that's the first author, and is from 2021, Irising, a new code uncovers the relationship of skeletal muscle and cardiovascular health during exercise. The journal is Frontiers in Physiology, and we are going to begin with the statistics that are really spiking and alarming about all of these uh, metabolic diseases. And these are the ones that we are going to witness now more than ever. Cardiovascular disease is the most common underlying cause of death accounting for 31.5% of all deaths worldwide. So one third of the population is dying from this kind of diseases. Is that enough for you to think about exercise as a strategy to heal or not? You need more percentage. Those are the questions that you should be asking and not just uh, finding excuses not to exercise. So it is estimated that 43%, 43.9, almost 44, of the adult population, this is in the United States, will suffer from some form of cardiovascular disease by 2030. So in just eight years, more than half of the population in the United States and that could be the case for Mexico as well, because we are competing for the first place of obesity and those cardiovascular diseases in these two countries. So it is pretty much also the same problem in many major uh, countries around the world that have the kind of habits of being sedentary and also eating large amounts of processed food. The total global medical cost of these diseases will reach 918 billion of the amount of money that is being spent in these kind of diseases. No wonder these many governments in many countries are not supporting now the um, the drugs, the pharmaceutical drugs that are going to be used to treat cardiovascular diseases because it is also a responsibility of many people of staying sick or becoming sick in these kind of diseases. Although progress in clinical treatment and care has reduced the mortality rate of patients with cardiovascular disease, the incidence of the disease continues to increase and good prevention and treatment strategies are still needed. It is well established that the physical exercise reduce, reduces all cause mortality and increases longevity. We have known this for quite some time, almost more than 50 years, there has been um, research, there has been evidence that exercise is one of the best way to sustain your health, to improve your overall metabolic functioning, 
and to also increase the cognitive uh, skills that you can have. Particularly, exercise reduces the risk of cardiovascular diseases, regulates the abnormal metabolism of blood lipids, and improves vascular function. This is just the three topics that are going to be covered in this article. But we know that exercise is doing much more about the brain and mental health. As the largest endocrine organ, the skeletal muscle secretes a hormone known as myokine. Irisin is a myokine secreted by the skeletal muscle, both in rodents and in humans. So it is a hormone. It is a myokine, meaning that it is being secreted by your muscle. And this hormone enters into the circulation during or immediately after physical exercise. So it is constantly being released by the amount of exercise and the kind of exercise that you are performing. Owning properties to driving white adipose tissue to browning. What does this mean? This means that this hormone is helping to turn around the white adipose tissue into brown adipose tissue, which is the one that helps you to alleviate insulin resistance, to improve glucose homeostasis and liver lipid accumulation. So irisin is emerging as a key molecular for metabolic diseases and other disorders known to improve with exercise. It is amazing how this kind of change in the kind of adipose tissue into this brown tissue, which has more mitochondria. That's why it is called brown tissue, because when you see it under the microscope, you can of look a uh, brown color because of the amount of mitochondria. And all of those mitochondria and the in this adipose tissue help to increase the lipid oxidation levels, which is going to help you to decrease the fat tissue. An increasing number of studies show that the concentration of circulating irisin in patients with some kind of cardiovascular disease has changed compared with normal people. Especially, it has been demonstrated that the application of irisin can affect the pathological processes and improve the disease state of certain cardiovascular diseases. In the review that I am talking and that I am using, researchers summarized the origin of irisin and discussed the regulation of irisin by exercise. Equally, they focus on the key role of irisin in the diagnosis of cardiovascular diseases, as well as the therapeutic effects of molecular mechanisms of certain cardiovascular diseases. So we are going to go into the process of reviewing how this amazing molecule that only has 10 years of the discovery has been used to uh, implement a lot of techniques into the diagnosis of these cardiovascular diseases and also how it is being used as a therapeutic agent to reduce many of these chronic cardiovascular diseases. And also we are going to talk at the end about some cognitive improvements and rejuvenating effects. So stay until the end because I'm going to review a diagram where we are going to see all of the effects. Irisin is a hormone composed of 112 amino acids, which was first discovered in 2012, as I mentioned just 10 years ago. And it was named after the Greek messenger goddess Iris. Why? Because it has a lot of properties about signaling in terms of all the cascade of molecules that are implied in this um, expansion of our cardiovascular health. In their original work, the muscle of transgenic, transgenic mice overexpressing 
peroxisome proliferator activated receptor gamma. That's the complex name of a molecule that it is abbreviated as PGC1 alpha. That molecule stimulates an increase in the synthesis of transmembrane fibronectin type 3 domain containing the protein 5, which is also abbreviated as FNDC5. And this protein is going to be cleaved or broken down and it secretes, secretes irisin. In humans, this um, molecule of FNDC5, the messenger RNA is mainly expressed in muscles and other muscle containing organ, such as the pericardium, the rectum, and the arteries, and can be detected in the blood, saliva, cerebrospinal fluid, and bronchoalveolar lavage fluid. So it is a lot of tissues where this molecule is traveling the messenger RNA of this molecule and it's going to improve. That's why it is a messenger molecule because it has been found in many organs and in many places where it is implied in the signaling mechanisms of helping to improve the metabolic functions of each of those organs. Muscle mass is the main predictor of higher circulating irisin levels in humans, and age-related muscle mass loss may lead to lower circulating irisin levels in el elderly people. So this means that the more you age, the less irisin mo molecule you are going to have circulating in your system. And if you are sedentary, even if you are younger, you are going to have lower levels than any other person that has physical activity in their lifestyle. So we have to be very aware of that because even if you have 20 years old, but you are a sedentary uh, young man or woman, you can have um, really low levels of this molecule compared to a person of 45 or 50 years old that is constantly exercising. So what is your choice? I am just giving you the details and I'm just giving you the science and all of the foundation so that you can decide your life because the future in terms of having the money for all the governments to heal these kind of diseases is not going to be enough. So nevertheless, all of this science, it was also demonstrating that circulating irisin levels increase with the increase of fat mass. So what does this mean? Particularly in obesity and correspondingly decrease with the decrease of fat mass after the bariatric surgery. But why does this happen? This is not to support that obese people have more of this molecule. This is a finding of how the body compensates when it receives a bariatric surgery. So this bariatric surgery is the removal of this fat mass in a procedure, in a surgical procedure, which is implying that your body has to compensate in certain ways. So given that the iris in expression in the muscle is 200,000-fold, sorry, 200-fold of that as in the adipocytes, it is much more important the kind of iris in release in muscle than in fat cells. And its key roles in lipid metabolism, it is possible that there is an irisin compensation mechanism, particularly in the obese people. When they lose all this amount of fat, it has a compensation measure. That is why they have more irisin. But that doesn't mean that they have more than the ones that exercise. 
A large number of studies have shown that irisin has a potential role in some metabolic diseases such as diabetes, obesity, and participates in the regulation of energy metabolism. As you can see, there is a lot of processes, a lot of diseases that there is participation of this kind of molecule. For example, it promotes the browning of white adipose tissue, as I mentioned at the beginning, which will increase the thermogenesis, which will reduce the lipid accumulation and will maintain glucose homeostasis in skeletal muscle, liver, and other organs. Why? Because all of these metabolic pathways are intertwined to um, start activating their production of ATP, which is the energy or the coin in your system. But when you are increasing and reducing the lipid accumulation, you are also promoting the glucose homeostasis because you activate all of these interwind pathways and you start creating more energy. Lipids are going to give you a lot more energy than sugars. This is just because the chain molecule of the lipids are, is much longer than a sugar. So acute exercise increases circulating irisin concentration. This is one of the first findings. As a myokine, myokine, irisin is produced by the contraction of skeletal muscle. According to the report, circulating irisin concentrations increase significantly when the muscle ATP level decreases and remain unchanged as the muscle ATP level remains unchanged. So what does this um, finding is telling us? It is signaling to us, it is telling to us that when our ATP levels, our energy levels are decreasing, the muscle ATP levels will remain unchanged and the circulating irisin concentrations are going to increase significantly because we need to activate again the production of ATP. But this happens if you have enough muscle mass and if you are priming your body to do exercise. If you are a sedentary person, these kind of pathways are not going to respond because they know that you are not going to use the energy you are going to just store the energy. So the signals are different. ATP decline, a state of metabolic demand, may be the initial signal that stimulates irisin secretion to defend muscle ATP homeostasis during exercise. So that's what happens when you are exercising. When these levels going are going down, there is a compensation of priming all the metabolic pathways and starting to burn the fat, produce ATP, use glucose and start the, uh, all of the glu glucose pathways and start producing much more ATP. A series of studies have shown that acute exercise is a potential stimulus to promote the secretion of this myokine. It has been reported that circulating irisin Concentrations of young healthy adults increase significantly 30 minutes after an acute exercise session. Furthermore, a single 40 minutes of aerobic running can induce minimal increase of serum irisin in both a hot or a cold environment. So it doesn't matter where you live, it doesn't matter where you exercise, what matters is the amount and the type of exercise that you are going to start performing. So we are going to understand what type of exercise is the best to signal the release of this molecule. 
Additionally, one time of high intensity interval exercise, which is known as the this H E E E uh, and moderate intensity exercise exercise, sorry, CME or resistance exercise R E can significantly increase the circulating iris in concentrations both in healthy people and in patients with metabolic syndrome. So even if you are sick already, you are releasing this kind of molecule. And one time of interval exercise, high intensity interval exercise, or moderate intensity exercise, or resistance exercise, so three types of exercise, significantly increase the circulating irising concentrations. As everyone knows, resistance training can improve muscle mass more effective than endurance training. According, accordingly, it was reported that resistant training promoted irising secretion more than endurance, endurance training or endurance and resistance combined training. So what is the best type of exercise? Resistance training. What does this mean? That the more you are increasing the amount of exercise and sometimes the intensity of exercise, the more you are going to increase the release of this molecule. This doesn't mean that you have to be uh, you have to begin with a very large amount of time in terms of performing exercise. If you haven't done exercise prior, you should start with 15 to 20 minutes of walking, for example. But then if you start improving the time and you start improving your condition your metabolic output you will start increasing in two weeks perhaps if you started from 15 minutes you can increase to 20 in another two weeks you can increase to 25 until you arrive to almost 50 minutes which is um, the most common measure in terms of the release of this amazing molecule so what happens in another study from another cohort of patients? Leisure time physical activity of moderate to vigorous intensity was measured in terms, in terms of the mortality in a large pool cohort analysis. What are the results? What do they find in this kind of long-term uh, analysis that they made. What did the researchers do and what do they find? The researchers pulled self-reported data on leisure time, physical activities, and also the BMIs, which is the measure of your height and the amount of, well, and your weight. The height and your weight, that's the BMI, and the number of patients is very, very good in terms of the statistics. So it's 650,000 individuals over the age of 40 years enrolled in Swedish and five U.S. prospective cohort studies, most of which were investigating associations between the lifestyle factors and the disease risk. They use this and other data to calculate the gain in life expectancy associated with specific levels of physical activity. A physical activity level equivalent to a brisk walking for up to 75 minutes per week, 75 minutes per week was associated with a gain of 1.8 years in life expectancy relative to no leisure activities. 75 minutes per week. 
that's more or less you have to do like four five times 15 minutes of walking a brisk walk that's it every from monday to friday 15 minutes of walking can increase two years your expectancy of life this is the meaning of the exercise being active having a physical activity level at or above the recommended minimum of the who of 150 minutes of brisk walking per week was associated with an overall gain of life expectancy of 3.4 to 4.5 years almost five years if you just improve the 150 minutes per week imagine that so just walking more or less 40 minutes every day from monday to friday resting the weekends or you can use the weekends as you wish improves 4.5 years in your life expectancy so how much do you want to live and how healthy do you want to be because it's not the same to age healthy that aging with a lot of these chronic diseases the physical activity and life expectancy association was also evident at all BMI levels. So it doesn't matter. Well, it matters, but not for this study, how much you weight. In terms of the BMI of all these people, they measured that the physical activity was evident in the life expectancy, even if you are right now in an obese level being active and normal weight was associated with a gain of 7.2 years of life being active and in your normal weight you don't even have to be in the athletic uh, measure or you don't even have to be in the lean measure you just have to be normal weight that's it and Seven years of expectancy, that's a lot of years that you can live longer than any other. Having a BMI of more than 35 kilograms per meter per square meter was the class two inactive and obese people. However, being inactive but normal weight was associated with 3.1 fewer years of life compared to being active but class 1 obese, which is a BMI of 30 to 34.9. So those are the statistics. Those are the numbers. You can always rewind to understand more about the measures. Having a BMI more than 35 is class 2 obesity and that is the expectancy is 7 years less than the normal BMI being in the class 1 obesity um, will reduce your life expectancy in 3 years so you choose where are you going to be positioned so what do these findings mean also these findings suggest that participation in leisure time physical activity even below the recommended level is associated with a reduced risk of mortality compared to the participation in no leisure time physical activity so you can even do those 15 minutes and increase more or less three years if you go beyond to the recommended of the WHO, you almost arrive to five years. And if you go beyond 115 minutes per week of exercise, you will increase more than seven years your life expectancy. And also, you are going to reduce the cardiovascular health 
well, the cardiovascular risk health. So you are going to reverse because diabetes, hypertension, uh, metabolic syndrome, many mental diseases, Alzheimer, Parkinson, many diseases, many diseases can be reversed just by adopting a lifestyle where you implement exercise in your life. And exercise meaning walking. This is just walking. If you go beyond, imagine just the levels of life and health that you are going to have. So this is just to make you really reflect about the kind of life that you want. These, all, all of these findings suggest that the risk, the reduced risk of mortality compared to participation is always much better. This result may help convince currently the inactive and sedentary people that a modest physical activity program may have these health benefits. And pay attention to what I said at the beginning. Many governments in many countries won't have the money to give you the treatments, even if you are in a covered health program, whatever it is. They are not going to cover many of these chronic diseases because of the amount of money that they are investing in this kind of um, many, it, it is going to be um, drastic, the word, but it is the word because these kind of diseases are just irresponsibility of people that don't want to exercise and that they justify that they don't have time. If they take away 30 minutes from the screens, they have those 30 minutes to exercise. So don't look for excuses and start exercising. The, the weight loss, the brain function, the mental improvement, and the quality of life is going to be much better in terms of how you implement these kind of exercise programs. The findings also suggest that physical activity at recommended levels or higher may increase longevity further and that a lack of leisure time at physical activity may markedly reduce life expectancy when combined with obesity. And we know that obesity is inflammation. We know that inflammation is the main cause of every disease, including many mental diseases. So it is your choice now to uh, go to the part that I spoke at the beginning. I'm going to show you how does this um, irisin molecule is working. So let's begin with the presentation of the molecule. What is happening now in your muscle? Look at this amazing uh, diagram and how you can start releasing this amazing molecule. Exercise is going to increase your skeletal muscle. And all of these muscle fibers have this kind of um, genes that are going to release this molecule, which I spoke, and that was the, the molecule that helped discover the other part of the gene that is going to be releasing this protein. And that is going, when it is cleaved, when it is broken down, it's going to release this blue molecule that is represented as the irisin molecule. So all of this increase in the kind of proteins that the myokines are releasing, well, that the fibers of the, mu of the muscle are releasing, are going to increase the circulation in the blood vessels of irisin. And this increase in the 
amount of irisin throughout your body is going to do these kind of functions in adipose tissue. It's going to increase the amount of brown tissue, brown fat, fat tissue, the one that has more mitochondria. It's going to decrease the size of adipocytes. So this meaning that it's going to decrease the inflammation process. Because if you have um, shrunk or if you have smaller adipocytes, your inflammation is reducing. The lipolysis is going to be also reduced. It is going to reduce the lipid synthesis. But it's going to increase the brown fat tissue um, thermogenesis and use of this kind of adipose tissue. So in conclusion for the adipose tissue, it is going to help you to get rid of many of your adipose tissue and it's going to give you the adipose tissue that you require to increase your metabolic functions. In the liver, it is going to in decrease the gluconeogenesis, which is the production of glucose in your liver. So it is going to also regulate the glucose levels in blood. And it is going to decrease the lipid accumulation in liver. So it is going to reduce the fat liver risk, which is a very also known disease for many people. And if you don't have a wood or a healthy liver, you cannot process anything because your liver is processing everything. The skeletal muscle, what does it do in the skeletal muscle? It's increasing the uptake of glucose. So it's going to use a lot of glucose to increase the ATP levels, so your energy. And it is going to also increase the GLUT4, which are channels that are going to um, allow the entry of glucose into the pathways to be burned and to be used. So it's going to regulate your glucose level. And it's going to increase the mitochondria biogenesis. So you are going to increase the number of mitochondria, which is extremely good for your health in terms of the antioxidant abilities that the mitochondria has. And in terms of also the amount of metabolic pathways that the mitochondria is performing and is giving you a lot of energy. So exercise induces the expression of this PC, PGC1A molecule in this skeletal muscle, which in turn drives the production of the membrane protein fibronectin type 3 domain, which is this, this is the whole domain of the protein. And then when it clips, when it broken down, it releases the irisin. This FNDC5 is cleaved and secretes the irisin, which is the blue ball, and irisin enters in the blood and participates in the regulation of all of these processes. So that's the amazing power of this molecule. Now, what does it happen in terms of cognitive functions and brain functions? Look at this. Irisin is cascading other um, mes messenger molecules such as the AMP, cyclic AMP, which is a cousin of the ATP, but, it's, but it is a cycle molecule. This uh, phosphokinase molecule, which is another signaling molecule, and another one that is a binding protein element that is going to signal in the nucleus the production and the increase of the BDNF mRNA. BDNF is the brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And we know already that this factor is going to increase neurogenesis, synaptic plasticity, and cognitive improvement. 
also when this physical exercise in another path increases the production of this FNDC5 that we saw, the messenger RNA also, it will increase irisin, and this is going to be released to the circulation. So this is a uh, two ways, two direction streets of arriving to increasing the production of irisin in the bloodstream and also increasing the production of, in an indirect way, when this irisin binds to the receptor in the membrane of a neuron to signal the production of BDNF. So you are producing through your neurons BDNF and allowing the neurogenesis the plasticity of your synapses, so you're creating new pathways and increasing the plasticity of your brain. And you are also improving your cognitive skills, learning skills. So this is all the schematic representation of the action on the neuron. Irisin stimulates this synaptic plasticity or neurogenesis and cognitive improvement by the induction of expression of the BDNF. Physical exercise is inducing also the production of this protein that we spoke before and the release of irisin. And this is going to signal through this molecule and the role of, of irisin in another study with other researchers in 2017 described a role of irisin in the brain and cognitive modulation without mentioning the BDNF, suggesting that irisin also has a protective effect against adverse environmental stimuli. What does this mean? This means that it reduces the damage in your neurons inducing also a protection of oxidative stress. When you have oxidative stress, it is being protected by this molecule and it is a beneficial effect that was caused by the inhibition of expression and secretion of many pro-inflammatory cytokines. So it is also signaling and other processes. These cytokines are the ones that are going to signal your body in terms of your immune system um, telling it that it is having an infection and that you need to start um, protecting your body. But irisin is going to um, rectify the signal and it is going to reduce the expression of these pro-inflammatory cytokines by protecting neurons and protecting all of these signaling systems in case you have stress. Imagine that you are protected through your organs, adipose tissue, liver, and skeletal muscle, and you're also protecting your neurons. What else do you want? This is much better than any pharmaceutical drug that I have ever listen to and it is produced just by doing exercise just by walking more than 150 minutes per week that's it that's your investment you don't need anything more to improve your health to improve your cognition to improve your life expectancy to rejuvenate your body and to really uh, help also in terms of the epigenetic mechanisms that are also being triggered by exercise that we are going to talk about in other episodes. So thank you for paying attention. I hope that this has enlightened you in terms of how much is doing for you the exercise and that you stop using excuses to not do exercise. Thank you very much. If you like the episode, 
give me a like, leave a comment, share, of course, the content and help me so that more people start opening their eyes to the real science and to the things that we can do just by changing our lifestyle. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day. Bye.